Okay, so once again, we are continuing to play very fundamental openings. So e3 is called the is called the calling. What is there to say about this? This is a, a very solid opening, but black doesn't change the way that they play. So we play knight f6. We basically play queen's gambit decline setup, regardless of how white puts his pieces together. What what do you mean? <laughs> okay, so c4. So here we've transposed to essentially a queen's gambit um, with the move e3, which is relatively innocuous because it blocks in the bishop. But we don't change the way that we play. We play queen's gambit decline here, e6. Yeah, the collie actually is not c4. If white wants to play the pure collie, the move is bishop d3, and I'll show the setup after the game. Knight c3, and uh, once again, we are putting... We are playing the, 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 the QGD setup, bishop e7, castles, all of the regular queen's gambit decline moves. Yeah, c6 is the slob setup, but we're blocking the bishop along this diagonal, but we can always fee in it. Um, rarely, does, uh, rarely does this bishop experience big problems. Okay, so he goes b4. What can we say about this, this way of playing? Well, first of all, what immediately jumps out to me is that White is not developing any of their kingside pieces at all, like zero. And we already know that the proper response to this kind of play is usually to open up the center. That allows us to punish our opponent for not developing. Now, it's not that easy to open the center here, right? Because we can't play c5. We can't play c5 because White's defending that square. We also can't play e5. I mean, just d takes e5. We can play d takes c4, but that really helps White develop, right? That helps White develop their bishop. So we can play b6 to prepare c5, but there is an even more effective way of making c5 possible, and that is to start by undermining this b4 pawn. How do we undermine that pawn? This is a pretty typical move, a typical response to the move before in many different openings. And that is the move a5, essentially forcing b5. I mean, white can also take on a5, but that still allows us to play c5. There's nothing... I guess white can play rook b1. Okay, bishop b2 just blunders the pawn. Bishop b2 just blunders the pawn. So we, we take on b4... And then, of course, we need to take the rook first because it's hanging. And we've solved our problem and won a pawn. I was hoping that he would go b5 for me to demonstrate the, the path forward there. Okay, thank you for the pawn. And we are also ready to play c5. We, we can go knight e4. We have a nice pin going here. White needs to be very careful not to lose in just a couple of moves. What, what our opponent needs to do is start developing ASAP on the king side. Otherwise, we're going to go c5, open things up, and just crash through. Okay. Bishop a3, good move. That's a that's a very decent move. Now, I think most people's instinct here would be to assume that you have to trade. But in fact, we have m many ways of either trading on our own terms uh, or even potentially declining the trade. So who can propose a nice way of keeping the tension here? Yeah, a paper. So I see two moves. The first is to play queen e7. And basically say, okay, I'm ready to trade bishops, but you're going to have to let our queen come to b4. Uh, we can certainly play knight c6. The, the downside of that move... Oh, it looks like my stream is dropping. Okay, my stream dropped some frames. Um, just refresh, guys. Knight c6 has the downside of blocking the, c5, uh, the c7 pawn, which I don't really like. Yeah, sorry. I think it's back now. I think it's back now. But to continue my thought, the, in my opinion, the best move here is to play c5. In my opinion, the best move is to play c5 because this move carries two ideas. If white takes, which probably white should do, then we take with the c pawn. We have a nice passer and we're attacking the knight. So we're continuing the initiative, right? The question, yeah. So if d takes c5, this seems like it poses... Uh, a pretty big challenge because now we've given up the pawn. We cannot take back because white's bishop x-ray defends the c5 pawn. But the move c5 in such openings carries a very important benefit. It opens up a pathway for another one of our pieces. What am I talking about? What am I talking about? I'm talking about the move queen a5. Now we're pinning the bishop. So bishop takes before or loses the queen. In fact, white's move is absolutely forced and that is to bring the bishop back to b2. And then we have a multi we have a multitude of moves there. He goes knight e2, that blunders the bishop. That blunders the bishop. 
Uh, what do we want to take it with? Well, this is a great example of not assuming that you need to trade pieces. Because the king remains in the center, and because the bishop on f1 has a hard time developing, I propose we take with the bishop. By keeping the queens on the board, we increase our chances of winning this game quickly. So now we still have this attack, and now we have an extra bishop on top of it. Does that make sense? So you have to resist the urge to always assume that trading is the best path forward. It's not. Okay, what to do now? King d1. It's just total desperation. He's trying to unpin the knight. I think that much is clear. Now uh, the path forward is to open up the center as quickly as possible. This king is stuck in the center. So it's pretty clear that the d-file is going to be our main avenue of attack. The d-file is currently closed. The simplest way to... Well, queen takes e5 is possible, but let's open it up by playing d takes e4. Try to identify what... And I always refer to it this way, the avenue of attack or the main pathway of attack. What I mean by that is precisely the file or the diagonal that's going to make the... You know, it's going to be the main path to your opponent's king. You cannot attack really without open files. Knight d4 is a great move, by the way. Trying to close down the e file, uh, the d file. What now? Well, can the knight be kicked out? That should be our initial instinct. Can we kick this knight? Yeah, we can. We can go e5. Very good. We could have also started by playing rook d8. That might have been even more precise. But this is perfectly good enough. We get the knight out of d4, and then we're going to go rook d8 check. And whatever happens, I know that's going to be good for us. Now, white can potentially force a queen trade here if he's very accurate. Let's see if he manages to do that. Yeah, he does. Oh, we have a cool move here. If we want to avoid the queen trade, which I don't know if we necessarily do. I think even on the queen trade, our attack continues. But if we wanted to avoid the queen trade, what move could we have played here? And it's fine. We won't. Yeah, we could have brought the queen back to d8, unpinning it from white's queen, and then taking the pawn of the bishop. But I knew he would play king c2, which is a bad move because it walks right into another check, which wins the game. What to do now? Now, the best way of developing is developing with check. The king is on c2. It's very vulnerable. And we give another check with the bishop. This is almost checkmate. e4 is, is literally forced. And of course, we have to understand that our threats against white's king are so much more significant than the fact that our bishop on a3 is hanging. Yes, it's hanging. Yes, he can take it to the queen. But look at the attack against white's king. That completely outweighs... Uh, that bishop on a3. Our bishop is no longer needed for the attack. Now, of course, we don't take on e4 with the bishop. That would be kind of dumb because it would allow knight takes e4. Um, we have to take on e4 with the knight, setting up a discovered, a devastating discovered check. And if white trades, then we take with the bishop and it's essentially checkmate. It's essentially checkmate. So white's days here are numbered. Knight takes a3. Okay, so here it's important to be accurate. Um, there is a move that I think some of you guys might be tempted to make, which is quite a big inaccuracy. Yeah, so I see some of you saying it. Rook d2 check, very tempting move. A piece of advice for attacking is be very careful about moves uh, that are made in close quarters with your opponent's king because a situation could arise where you give a check like rook d2. White moves the king back to c1, and all of a sudden your knight on e4 is tied down to the very rook that you just put on d2. The, the king is a very pesky defender. So attacking from a distance is often better than just putting your rook and your bishop and your knight right next to your opponent's king, because those pieces could actually start uh, could actually start getting loose, if that makes sense. Knight takes c3 is the simplest move, but re wins back the extra piece, opening up a check on the king, and it's made in a couple of moves. Okay, now, you know, there's a very similar checkmate in two. Now rook d2 is good, but still not the most accurate. The most accurate, of course, is queen b4 check. King c1 and then rook d1 mate. This is very easy. And a simple attack that concludes successfully. Boom. All right, good game. Over 1100. Okay, a little postmortem. That was a simple game, but I think an instructive one. Now, the Kali system named after Edgar Kali, who uh, I believe was 
I'm not sure what his nationality was. I want to say Hungarian, but let me let me look this up. No, Belgian. Edgar Kali, Belgian chess master, 1897 to 1932. Very, very strong player. Died very young. Um, but introduced quite a bit of influence into opening theory. So what I would compare the Kali system to is the London. Uh, the Kali is like the London. The difference is that this bishop on c1 is generally speaking fianchettoed rather than put on f4. But there's a lot of similarities. Um, so the pure the pure Kali is bishop d3 in this position. That's how Kali himself played it. And basically, it, it's quite a symmetrical opening. You know, black can play bishop d6 here or bishop b7. Both moves are fine. And generally what happens is that, whoops, no, not bishop f8. Castles are now b3. And white uh, puts his other bishop on b2, and the bishops are kind of, I think they're called collinear bishops. Um, and, you know, white then can play c4. It's You, you can check my game with Jeffrey Zhang at the U.S. Championship. I, I won a nice game with a colleague against him. Um, and black has a gazillion different setups. Black can play c5, black can fianchetto his own bishop, uh, black can do neither. So I don't want to delve too deeply into the theory. I'm sure we'll probably face it again. Okay, so Dan R. Primo asks, why not develop the, the light squared bishop, I assume, even before playing e6? Because I, I think a lot of people would find this counterintuitive. But the problem is that you don't have a good spot to develop it to. The only spot to develop this bishop is g4. Bishop g4 is a viable move. But what could end up happening here is that this bishop gets pushed around. Like, white can go knight e2, and this bishop starts getting kind of pushed around. I'm not sure, I'm not convinced that it's that great on h5. But bishop g4 is a legitimate, legitimate option. Okay, so bishop e7, castles, castles. Or sorry, no, 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 that, that's not what happened. He went c4. Ahmad chess, thank you. e6, knight c3, bishop e7. And now he goes for this plan. a3. Um, yeah, c5 is fine. C, c5 is a legitimate move as well. Castles and b4. So b6 here would be quite good as well. b6 and c5 is... A uh, typical plan as well. But but White could potentially go c5 here and close everything down. And if you go a5, if you go a5, um, then, then White plays... I don't think there was a disconnection. Then White plays bishop b2 and everything is fine. White holds this together. Chris Velos asks, what if he pushed c5 here? Well, if he pushed c5 here, then we take on b4. And the rook on a1 hangs. So white doesn't have time for this. That's the whole point. That's what, oops, sorry. That's why we need to play a5 so quickly. And if b5, then we go c5 and we open up the center. I'm not saying this is that great for black, but at least it's a good way to try to punish him for overextending his pawns. Um, queen a4, I guess, is a way to stop a takes b4, but it's not going to end very well. Queen on a4 like this is way too loose. Uh, black probably has many ways to play here. Um, maybe just bishop d7, get the queen out of there, and if b5, then again we can go c5. I'd have to think about it, but queen a4 is not a big danger. Yeah, once bishop b2 is played, the game is almost over. We win this pawn, we get a pin, and then we very quickly play c5. This is the most important move of the game. So what does this teach us? When your opponent offers a trade and you feel like you have an initiative, always try to find ways to trade on your own terms. By that I mean you can... You can trade or you can decline the trade, but there is this middle ground where you say, okay, I'm willing to trade, but you're going to have to give me something for that trade, either a pass pawn. Um, and you'll often see if, if we had an A pawn, we might have gone A5 as well. It, it, there's many opening variations that build precisely on that idea. For instance, even in the Bogo Indian defense, after bishop d2, one of the most common moves here is either A5 or C5 or queen e7, all of which are examples of trading on your own terms. Okay. Um, okay, so it should be two, takes, 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 then we go c5, dc5, and queen a5. Another very typical idea. You see this in the Grunfeld sometimes as well. You might ask, how do I know about this idea? Well, in the Grunfeld, this c5 and queen a5 idea recurs quite frequently. Um, and, and that's one of the ways that I know ideas. Like, when you have a lot of experience in chess, you know a lot of different openings, and these openings teach you different ideas. So, for instance, of the Grunfeld, uh, Black's main continuation here is c5, dc5, and queen a5, creating a pin and threatening knight e4. 
Okay, so back to the game. Bishop a3, c5, takes queen a5. Bishop, okay, this blunders a piece and then the game ends quickly. White's only move was bishop b2. But then after queen takes e5, the position remains basically losing because we're threatening to win a second pawn. And if white takes on d5, then this is totally, totally crushing. Okay, so that's uh, simple enough. Simple enough. And this shows how to punish early queenside play without development. Thank you, General Lilnept. And what I want to add as we transition back into Blitz is that I think this is a very underestimated way of studying chess. People only want to look at games within their opening repertoire. Don't do that. Try to expose yourself to games in many different openings. Not only does it educate you generally, but you learn all these new ideas and you know you become more comfortable in case you decide to play a different opening. And, and you also just, you can borrow ideas. That's completely a legitimate thing. We saw that here. Borrowing ideas from one line to another is, you know, from one opening to another enriches your play and allows you to figure out how to play in unfamiliar positions.